Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for the invite, Miguel Valencia, Alena Esmar, and Jacqueline Bolaños. Thank you for the work they did. The countless women who do the invisible work for this conference to happen, it is important to make them visible. Thank you. I feel very excited to be here because, yes, I come from Patagonia, from Argentina, from Latin America, and I also work with many people who are here today from a global Latin American perspective in what we call the Group of Alternatives to Growth. And we have with here Miriam Lande, Edgardo Lander, Alberto Costa, Willy Brown, Pablo Bartinac, and with whom eight years ago we were meeting every year so as to think deeply about the problems of the social, ecological, territorial struggles in our region. So in my 20 minutes, I would like to synthesize certain debates, stemming from the point that we are living the times of the Anthropocene. And therefore, it is important for us to acknowledge that human beings have become a force of global geological reach that is extremely dangerous. We have went past a threshold, and now nature is responding in a non-lineal way, but rather it's uh, something unpredictable and uh, the damage is irreversible. The question is, what type of Anthropocene do we want to live in? What is our moral responsibility, our political responsibility, vis-a-vis -vis the change scenarios we can construct? And at the same time, it is important to acknowledge that there are different narratives about what is happening in this time of socio-ecological crisis at a great scale. There are three narratives that I would like to summarize as an introduction. There is one of collapse, and it is very strong. It is very present in the agenda nowadays. There's an enormous amount of books who speak about the collapse. So instead of speaking about the collective imagina imagination, they provide scientific evidence of the level of the crisis and the impact on the planet. And the danger of collapse, the global collapse of our society, the Jared Daniels book on collapse, and the writings of Fernandez Duran, the Spaniard who died no long ago, they precisely speak of the great danger of collapse that is also testing our societies. And they point out to the fact that the possibility of collapse is related to the lack of complexity or the loss of complexity at all levels and to the loss of political values that have been traditionally associated to the things we respect in our democracy. So it is true that in the history, there's never been a society that who's aware of the impact that developmental policies have in our planet and the threshold that is opening up for a possible catastrophe. There is a second hypothesis or narrative that the establishment manages and is the technocratic solution, the capitalistic solution to the capitalistic crisis without affecting the root causes, the structural causes. It just appeals to technology on behalf of well-being, like geoengineering. Geoengineering is more and more not the plan B, but rather the plan A of the world elites in the name of progress to save capitalism. And in 2018, there are two important essays of geoengineering, and their purpose is to tamper with climate at a large scale. That is another big debate that we should have, because in little time, it will be a part of the public agenda. And it is a debate that is facing us to the idea of an elite who wishes not to change the system, not to change the model, but rather to remake nature, to resemble technology. 
And there's a third narrative, and I believe that is the one that we are now more related to re beyond the concepts we call it, and that is the narrative related to social resistances, the new categories of thinking, the anti-capitalistic criti critique, Federico de Maria, did a very interesting presentation of the progress of the notion itself of growth and what it has cost. And even though it's existed since the 70s, when I wrote a prologue on degrowth, I pointed out that in reality there are two moments or two lives of degrowth. The first life during the 1970s where there were the North and the South were not connected, and the second time as of 2003-2002, when doors were opened, bridges were built, and there was a connection due to the socio-ecological crisis between degrowth and the categories that we are elaborating and we have been working on for some time in the South. When I wrote that prologue, I is. I should also say that I had the idea, and I still have it, that the notion of degrowth was is a slogan, and I believe that it is a motto, because it goes being just a slogan. Degrowth is a field that is common, and it houses different ideas that connect the critique of Economics to growth, economics for pr productivity. And there's a very interesting critique of the metabolic profile of our societies from which I've learned greatly. And it also houses very powerful concepts that point to a different type of rationality or uh, social or environmental rationality of uh, common good, the basic good as a proposal, dematerialization, autonomy, and others a rich vocabulary that is illustrated by local experiences that have been disseminated in the North and the South, and where some of them can be highlighted, like the city of transition, the cultural communities, the currencies. There are many experiences that are obliging us to have a reflection around those exemplary models. In Latin America, it was as of the year 2000 when we first witnessed a new stage of accumulation, of consolidation, a way of appropriation of nature. And we have called it new extractivism. It's a stage of neoliberal capitalism that implies that there's greater pressure exerted on the, the lands and the extraction so as to preserve a consumption model that requires more matter, more energy. In the South and Latin America, we're at the core of this strategy, this capitalistic strategy. In this sense, I believe that speaking of the Anthropocene in Latin America is to speak about neo-extractivism and the different consequences. Latin America, in this sense, is also a region of the planet who traditionally has been extractivistic in nature. Ever since the, since the times of the conquest, Potosí, for instance, we have all pointed out to the, the DNA of extractivism that, that we were so important in the geography's extraction for centuries, however, extractivism has acquired new dimensions due to the socio-ecological crisis and the giantism of projects, the great scale of the projects, projects that seek to extract different raw materials and goods and are seeking massive export. New extractivism is a privileged window to look into different dimensions of crisis at the global level, not only regional ones, let us think about the role that China has acquired, the Popular Republic of China. The role it plays in Latin America, during it, the role it's had in the last 10, 10, 15 years, because China, through the demand of commodities, has consolidated a more unequal exchange with our countries. And in an attractive way, they are exporting more specialized goods, more raw materials, more commodities, and they are importing more and more high value, high added value products from China. So it is also possible for us to interpret this difficult, controversial 
process of hegemonic transition where China is the hegemonic power from the consolidation of the new extractivism in the South countries. And new extractivism is also connected to a great concern that we have in a region, which is the retraction of the borders of democracy, the beginning of a new cycle of human rights violation that it comes hand in hand, not only of criminalization, but the assassination of activists, human rights activists, environmental activists who have been murdered, Latin America, as global Witness says, is the place of the world where more activists are killed. In 2016 and 2017, 200 activists were murdered, 60% of them in Latin America. And our region is one in which this global process of uh, using abusing of the land and, and extractivism is being heightened because this is a region of the world where there is the greatest amount of hoarding of the land. And the expansion of the borders in Latin America Think about the Amazons and how the, this expansion of borders is the expansion of death. So it is not random that our critical reflections, in a way, have been constructed upon or, or in questioning development and the developmental models. And it's not random that our concepts of horizon are clouded by the notion of alternatives to development we should de abandon the idea of development altogether. Gustavo Esteva, others have said this. They have criticized the concept of development as a discourse of power, this mandate of central nations that has neglected local realities and has made, has also ignored the ancestral wisdom of the South. So it is in our countries that the post-development, post-structivism horizon categories at the core, central stage of the reflection. In the group of alternatives to development that we have participated in, we've been working there for more than eight years, we have tried to reflect on the two levels that we should consider to be able to think about strategies, the micro uh, dimension who speaks about local experiences, social economics, agroecology that is so expanded in a country like Mexico, but is now beginning to expand in countries so closely linked to agro-food businesses like Argentina. But we're also thinking about a more macro social perspective, so as to be able to think in more a more theoretical way in, in concepts that can guide us in the possibility of change. And I was thinking about that more macro level. And I was thinking about the Asuni project that Alberto Acosta defended in Ecuador, a project that is related to Laboratoria, the suspension of oil extraction to leave the oil in the subsoil. The Yasunifo project is a quite innovative one. However, it faced the contradictions of the progressive Ecuadorian government, but also, as Alberto has pointed out, it, the most powerful countries did not want to uh, assume their own responsibility. There was an interesting movement in the Yas Unidos, and it promoted a consul, uh, consultation. The Yas Uni project has left a print, and therefore we are obliged to think once again about the moratory, concrete action, especially nowadays, because in Latin America, one of the main problems is the expansion of extreme energies, the expansion of extreme energies, not only of the exploitation of hydrocarbons, non-conventional hydrocarbons to fracking, but also of the offshore reservoirs in the deep waters and of the bituminous crude oils in different regions of America promoting a specific actions would be an interesting project proposal, a moratorium that is required. In, in Latin America, 
Aside from relating the development model to the productivist paradigm of the affirmation of growth as an end on its own, aside from linking it to an instrumental notion of nature, we should not forget the imagina Im imagination that we have around nature. We believe in Latin America that we have infinite resources because in Latin America we're so rich in resources that regardless of the economic cycles, we can make use of them and the most powerful nations can extract them forever. It's as if Latin America was created to feed the world. With those goods are underground or, or those goods are at risk, somebody has spoken about the curse of abundance Let's speak about the naturalistic imaginary of social Latin America's perspectives that we hear so much in the progressive cycle. Related to the progressive governments who have consolidated neo extractivist models, but that also related to the most traditional Marxist representations. Now, I'll speak of a third subject. There's a third subject that I need to discuss, and it has to do with the new political grammar categories that have been created because of the la uh, struggles, the fights to, for the land as a trend. What we see in Latin America during the last 10 years is what I call the eco-territorial twist as a trend, where different languages converge. On the one hand, we have a more community-based, indigenous-related language, and on the other one is the environmental discourse. And thirdly, and more and more importantly, as Federico has explained, feminism, the feministic language. Horizon concepts like living well, the rights of nature, environmental justice, have as a commonality the autonomy, the ethics of care that has not been yet named. And those are concepts that open up to the possibility of thinking of a different type of social and environmental rationality. And in a way, they re uh, recover or rescue different perspectives from Latin America. In this sense, we have great wealth. There's a convergence of disciplines that today are thinking about the problem, Ge critical geography, in Brazil, political ecology, environmental history, agroecology, sociology, social movements, critical anthropology. Critical anthropology, for instance, at this level, had given the main contributions of the recent past. And this has even rise to what we call in the academic literature, the ontologic twist. And that is to go to a field where different approaches are trying to rethink the relationship towards nature. And because of the socio-ecological crisis, what they've done is to revalue other visions, other relationships, the relationship towards nature that the original peoples had, the native peoples have had throughout the centuries. So it's late, yes because of the magnitude of the crisis, but at least it is trying to get a new epistemological understanding from a non-dualistic perspective, one that is relational in nature and that explores the relationships between human and unhuman. And it emphasizes the existence of different worlds and realities. There's not a single reality, there's not a single type of nature, perspectivism of the uh, American Indian communities, the pluribition of the universal, spins around this, but those are not just epistemological tricks, but rather it's not about emphasizing the ways of understanding the world, or rather it has to do with ontology, with the acknowledgement of diversity, the diversity of ways of being. It is 
under those lines are two concepts. One that was created in Latin America, as you know, the concept of the living well, and the second one of the relationship between the North and the South, and that is the ethics of care. Living well, the living well concept, there are more, many people here who might have better perspectives about this, but good living in Latin America is related to the experience of the original peoples, but it also it's also related to the notion of the rights of nature because they play center stage the need to develop a biocentrical approach, a relational approach. The notion of the rights of nature is something that you might know is also connected to the constitution of Ecuador in 2008 they included the rights of nature in their constitution, so they established that nature is not an object, but rather it is a subject of a right. And lots of water has crossed under the river since then. The good living concept includes different emancipatory concepts, but it has been abused and tampered with by progressive governments. It was dissociated from the concept of uh, the rights of nature, and it's been reconnected to the concept of capabilities and human development. It has been empty, emptied of its power, disruptive power of having a new way of relating to nature. And finally, Another narrative, the other narrative, I'll try to summarize it, and I apologize if I'm being cryptic, because, but I don't have much time. It is the narrative regarding the role of women in the fight. It's something that's been made invisible. It's, it's not something that would surprise anybody, but I believe that this increasing importance of feminism is creating bridges with the ecofeminisms and the uh, economy of care. Ecofeminism is becoming more and more relevant. Ecofeminism did not was not created in the academia. Of course, in the 70s, in the United States, many things were questioned when the possibility of a nuclear war was being uh, press presented. The culture of war was questioned, but also the patriarchal culture behind the conception was also highly questioned. Ecofeminism is an effort that was made to create a new meaning of the negative parallelism between women and nature. I'll wrap it up. So an effort was made to create a new meaning for the relation between women and nature, as well as it also promoted concepts such as care. It is a concept that has great history and this was done under the framework of the ethics of care, that care is something that men and women should share alike. It is a, a, a faculty of relationships. And in this sense, it is necessary in order for us to understand the survival of the species. Patriarchy, as Karina has said, is what separated care from the role of men as if it was the sole responsibility of women. Now, the ethics of care had been um, reshaped, and popular communism from the South um, have that as a core value. So those who are risking their bodies, defending life, the, uh, defending the biodiversity, it's women. In this sense, Neo-extractivism in this stage of exacerbation is creating more visibility to the margins, to the women who are denouncing not only the environmental impact, but also the social sanitary impacts of the expansion of oil prospects, uh, borders by phosphates and others. It's women who are desacralizing the myth of development, women who value care and they are relating it as the cornerstone. And they are the ones who are passing from the interdependence notion to be able to understand life to the notion of eco-dependency by highlighting the importance of other languages to value things, to beyond others, to place life center stage. 
So it is important to decolonize the social imaginary. That's a big challenge. It is important to promote um, the concepts at our core from the center and the periphery in post-development, post-destructivism had to be further developed because they are accompanied by powerful proposals. And it is important to bring the feminist approach in a field, ecofeminism, to a field of degrowth because ecofeminism is not another column or another item within the wider perspective of degrowth, but rather it's a core, a frame concept. It is a framework concept that is forcing us to think that humanity it's not something that is defined through competition. Man is not a, a wolf, homo hominis lupus. Man is de defined as an empath empathic being, empathetic being. <laughs>